Um, right. My work with the special collections and archives at Goldsmiths is primarily taken up by the Women's Art Library. I'm going to share instances of creative work that I've had the privilege to facilitate since the Women's Art Library was gifted to Goldsmiths in 2004. To highlight the dynamics fostering creativity in this art library, I'm going to consider the relationships between myself as the collection steward, the artists who are both builders and subjects of this collection, and the users and artistic researchers who complete their search with new knowledge, uh, for new knowledge by contributing their findings to the Women's Art Library collection. Implied in these relationships is a feminist ethics of care. This is my desk as it looked before the pandemic. And <coughs> although I haven't seen it for the last two months, I'm confident that the materials have piled on top of it higher and higher. The desk is a shifting display of almost all donated and recently produced material awaiting their accessioning into the Women's Art Library collection. Anyone who comes to this desk to find me cannot resist reaching out to give something a closer look. These encounters are micro-transformative, sparks that indicate the Women's Art Library, even here, is at work. It's, it's my privilege, I keep saying privilege, it is, um, today to consider the art library through the critical creative work of artists and activists I have worked with. One of the most important of these individuals is Ego Ahiwe Sawinski, whose reimagining of the cover to Kate Eichhorn's brilliant book, The Archival Turn in Feminism, says so much about the continuum of knowledge making that art libraries inspire. I am part of a feminist network of cultural producers who undertake artistic research that questions and revitalizes the idea of an art library. My connection to this work was made in 1989 as a volunteer joining the Women Artists Slide Library in London. This art library was a rallying point, a kind of political focal crystallization for British-based women artists to set up an educational resource that celebrated women's art practice. Surrounded by the filing cabinets of slides and shelves and books, catalogs, magazines, and Fulham Palace in what was then the, uh, what had been the Bishop's Library, I became connected to a persuasive mass of evidence of women's creative work organized by the politicized determination of feminist artists and educators. This is where I learned what an art library could do. There is in this photo of Rita Keegan at her desk at the Women's Arts Artist Slide Library in Fulham Palace in front of a rather sort of splendid fireplace. The essence of my understanding what and who the work of art libraries is for. This image illustrates an article I wrote for the Rita Keegan Archive Project website that and was subsequently published in the book uh, Mirrors Reflecting Darkly. And in it, I describe how Rita's example taught me how archive building and the Women's Art Library produced a community of visitors who were not just clients, but peers. Her desk was a threshold of knowledge exchange and effective mutual support. And in the article, I sort of describe how people came from, well, they came from all over the world and had to negotiate sort of getting through uh, Bishop's Park to find this place buried in the middle of a complex, which was the actual film palace. <clears throat> And this is a still from a, fil a, a beautiful film by uh, Holly Antrim, Yes to the Work. And uh, in it, we invited people who had uh, realized projects in the Women's Art Library to come, in this, to come into the space, be, not be interviewed, but have a, have a kind of conversation between themselves to describe and kind of actually reanimate the space uh, in a way that seems to be special to the Women's Art Library, seems to be defined by the fact that there is this collection of, uh, dedicated to women's art in the stack next door. 
and uh, I like the way these uh, these bits of um, di uh, dialogue have been kind of transcribed and become part of the still, a uh, part of the image. And at this point, Gina Nembard, who is um, on the far uh, at the end there, is pointing out that. Uh, the Women's Art Library frames our encounters with books, boxes, books, papers, and photographs as an invitation to a two-way exchange. She talks about how what it was, you know, the power of encountering the Women of Color Index for the first time, and then understanding that uh, uh, that there was one single individual behind its uh, coming together, which was uh, Rita Keegan. These boxes and files have been deliberately assembled by artists to represent themselves. And so within the Women's Art Library, there are the sub-collection like the Women of Color Index was, was a project that reached out to uh, um, artists who, uh, and created files on them. But there's also a whole kind of um, uh, aspect to the collection which is completely determined by what artists choose to send in. When you see a magazine article or postcard or flyer in one of Rita's boxes, and uh, we've recently acquired the uh, Rita Keegan uh, archive, this is intrinsic to the experience of l looking. And it, it becomes part, because it instigates a question of why did she save this? Artists contributing material to the Women's Art Library were concerned with the issue of lack of visibility. The slides, ephemera, and other donated materials were submitted to the art library to fill a gap. The conversation with an artist that a user experiences through her archive will highlight what she senses to be missing from mainstream media and how art is validated back then in the 1980s, 90s, 2000s, but also now in the art world. The Heritage Lottery funded Rita Keegan archive project organized her materials to include recordings of Rita guiding us through the boxes. And they include one that is titled the touchy feely box. And this stuff, <clears throat> I love bringing out this box when I'm introducing the collection. It's filled with aesthetically and conceptually stimulating ephemera as a gesture of artistic knowledge sharing. All of us who work with this material should be understood as working within the parameters uh, defined and in the hands, we are in the hands of the artists. Now this slide shows the same slide collection expanded across time and geographical spaces. It is not until the Women's Art Library found a home in an Institute of Higher Education library that maintaining the connection to contemporary practice became a kind of urgent and critical part of maintaining the collection's relevance. It needs to be constantly reevaluated, or else it feels like it becomes fossilized. The phrase, we're in the library, for me, Evo you know, evokes excitement and a kind of sense that uh, the, the, this is a communal space where everybody's welcome. And, but it also critically evokes a, uh, the idea of a safe meeting place for critical work, as well as the eager discovery. As a longtime steward of the Women's Art Library, I'm also subject to reevaluation. This work by Amelia Hawke, she was then Amelia Beavis Harrison, came about when I responded to a call for curators to become the subjects of a costume work. I'm pretty sure this I saw this call through Arliss, actually, so I was emboldened to think of the library as a curated collection. Amelia was intrigued, and during her visit, I told her the story about the time when the entire teaching collection of slides held at the Goldsmiths Library was being physically dismantled and thrown in a skip out the back. I arranged the rescue of the relatively few but significant slides of work by women to add to the Women's Art Library's slide collection. From this story came a vision of this futuristic guardian of the slides, 
The skirt's pink gradient represents the pigment deterioration of aging slides. The number references the chemical formula of sperm, so that the artist has me embody a kind of resurrection of women's art from the fading patrimony of traditional art history. It was almost impossible to get into as well. <laughs> <clears throat> It feels more critical than ever that this collection is in the constantly challenged environment of goldsmiths. Jessica can tell you lots about that. I have Jessa Mockridge here, <laughs> who's um, a, a, a colleague, comrade, um, where important feminist scholarship helps realize the Women's Art Library as a singularly effective, creative learning space. This has been nurtured not just by lecturers in the arts departments and visual cultures, but by lecturers in sociology and uh, the media communications department. You know, the art library is seen to offer the opportunity for them to bring their students into a place where they can rethink other cultural spaces in terms of creative interventions. This is one of Nirmal Puar's favorite um, items from the uh, Fanny Adams uh, box that Fanny Adams were uh, a short-lived but very uh, interesting um, British a group of British women artists who uh, modeled themselves on the Gorilla Girls, you know, remained anonymous and took out very uh, you know, interesting ads with slightly skewed statistics and uh, did actions like uh, distributing this map on the steps of the National Gallery. The Women's Art Library itself is viewed as an intervention in the academic library that offers a space to share a particularly tactile experience of artistic materials documenting these art practices. And I love the way Chloe here is captured saying something about magical that this, when they were describing the space, uh, she actually um, picked up on that. It's for, anyway, it's kind of flattering because she's very hardcore, sort of serious <laughs> um, scholar. Um, Chloe was a student in Nirmal's class on feminist methodologies, who has since become a lecturer and supporter of the Women's Art Library through her be being uh, part of the editorial board of uh, Feminist Review. The creative potential of working with a politically charged collection makes comrades out of colleagues. And as I mentioned, this includes Jessa Mockridge, who will be joining me later to give a first-hand account of working creatively with the Digital Archive of Artist Publications. So I'm really happy to have her here, and we'll give her space to um, do that. And here is another two very critical uh, uh, colleagues, friends. It's hard to define because with uh, Catherine Grant, we, we worked together when the Women's Art Library was an independent organization, but she has since carved her own career as a uh, feminist art historian and was at Goldsmiths, where she became the chair of the, uh, the advisory board that helps um, determine uh, run projects like the bursary at the Women's Art Library, and she's now, um, I think, a vice dean at the Courtaulds. And and Flick Allen, Felicity Allen, who has another uh, another sort of uh, powerful figure, who was, who in her very early days was part of a uh, the collective that uh, set up the Women Artists Slide Library at Battersea Art Center in 1981-82. So, Catherine. Uh, recently shared a, a, an, an article with me after hearing this, uh, these authors speak in uh, New York last spring. And uh, this is a very um, interesting article that when I started reading it, I was struck by how accurately uh, it identified the emotional underpinning of my stewardship of the Women's Art Library collection. Um, this, this it's it's not you're you're in the job day to day, but there is something that is driving you and making you turn up. And from my point of view, having started as a volunteer so long ago with this collection, and then had to sort of see it through to it becoming gifted into a an institutional uh, library, 
and I'm still working with it. There's something else going on besides it's just a job, and I feel kind of responsible for this stuff. Um, so it's guided me to also very critically nurture creativity as a guiding principle for maintaining the collection. It's not only a space for enhancing feminist art scholarship, it is an example of grassroots self-organizing where art, art documentation is given a role in the struggle for social justice. As the custodian of this collection, I've sometimes felt at odds with established ways of working in institutions so that I recognize and identify with the description offered by the articles of this article, Michelle Caswell and Marika Seifor, who are making an argument to apply a feminist ethics to the role of archivists and see them as, quote, caregivers, bound to records creators, subjects, users, and communities through a web of mutual affective responsibility. I'm not strictly working with an, ar with an archive, but the relationships fostered in my work are indeed such a web of responsibilities, and this holds my work alongside the creative work that the Women's Art Library generates. Firstly, there is the relationship between archivist and record creator. In my case, I am the equivalent to an archivist, and the record creator is the woman artist who would submits her documentation or donates her publication. In the setting of the Women's Art Library, when an artist donates anything from slides to zines, they are creating a record of their practice in the art library. My custodianship of the collection has been defined by the affective bond I have with the woman artist. I was trained for this work through an art education, and this has informed the way I work on behalf of the artist's material. I prioritize access, and I want to see these artists' names appearing everywhere and finding, and appearing everywhere and multiple, in multiple spaces. And I find myself wanting to see materials, for instance, listed across the library catalog as well as the archive catalogs at Goldsmiths. And although these kind of things may not be practical, it's, it looks as if we're duplicate, I've got duplicate materials, I'm not quite sure why. Um, I still want to generate as many profuse and wayward descriptive vocabularies as there are artists. You can tell I'm a lousy catalog. <laughs> okay. um, then there is the relationship between the archivist and the subject of the record, which entails a detailed analysis of responsibilities towards those who may be represented in the archives. The wall collection subject is the art practice, ra the art practice rather than the personal um, lives of women artists. We collect documentation and kind of discourage uh, women artists from donating uh, personal archives like letters or, um, set, but often these these uh, these boundaries are blurred and. Uh, you know, one example was a, a, a very um, critical uh, collection of letters that was described over the phone to me as relating to uh, a, a, between two uh, women who were art students, and all they ever talked about was art. But when it came, but when a researcher came to look at these these letters, in fact, it was deeply personal, and art only came in intermittently. And the sad and and the 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 power of these letters was that uh, one of the uh, correspondents was no longer living, and the you know the pain uh, for the the um, correspondent who donated the letters was such that she had never reread them. And so there is this kind of uh, so again when I talk about a safe space, I am talking about um, that uh, it is critical to um, understand that. Uh, this stuff is donated in order to encourage creativity, but it can be, it's, a, it's, a, it's not just a playground. That you There is also a responsibility to these materials when they are handed over for creative work. Um, the, 
Okay. So the Women's Art Library is, 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 is constituted of materials that focus on the representation of practice mostly, and, they invi and this invites more practice to generate visibility. And it situates the art library as a crucial means of professionalizing marginalized art practices. And this is Isik Tutzner with her uh, uh, a view of her an installation called her museum. The acquisition, or rather donation, of the Women's Art Library collection to the library at Goldsmiths was, I like to think, conceived by the librarians working at Goldsmiths at the time as, a, as an affirmative action. It is thanks to the foresight of the head of the library in 2003, Sasha Shaw, and the subject librarian for art and design at the time, Jacqueline Cook, that the Women's Art Library could become at long last secure. Um, following the withdrawal of funding f for the arts organization that had built it, that had, and at that point was known as Make the Organization of Women's Art. Um, so the funding had been withdrawn and the collection was looking for a home, but it also found a new context for its work as an advocate of marginalized practices in, this, in the uh, university art library setting. I love this quote from Jacqueline. It's from her thesis. It was something that she wrote after the collection had arrived in, in the, um, at Goldsmiths. So while, <coughs> and it talks about, I think for me, the most important thing is this idea of collecting, and of course you're all involved in this, it, but uh, to avoid the simplified and the reductive vision version of history that uh, seems to, yeah, that's especially critical for um, art practice. So while the art women, the, the Women's Art Library is not, you know, is very far from being a kind of comprehensive collection, and I always emphasize this, um, the, 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 the gaps, the, 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 the nature, the, the kind of chaoticness of it, because it that can feel, well, I can certainly um, you know, point to the chaoticness of, of the um, collection, which is all organized by individual artists. So unless, uh, so it can be an overwhelming experience to sort of walk in and sort of think, where do I start? Where do I start? But it's also, you know, that kind of um, uh, sense of disorientation um, is also, a way of reminding us it, of how incomplete it is. And as, uh, as Nirmal Puar uh, points out, it's this awareness of ongoing absence is critical and it's also another means of inviting uh, creativity as part of the process of contributing what you want to be in there. For example, uh, this work, It Looks Queer to Me, um, by uh, this is Kiona Hagen Niehaus uh, performing with a box of materials that were not catalogued. They were probably labeled miscellaneous, if labeled at all, and they were waiting for my attention year after year. In her performance, which is silent but registered as a monologue on the side, um, she's writing in that chat box um, w with being prompted by the physical objects uh, that she's picking up, and she's writing autobiographically about identifying as a queer young woman and her experience of queerness that she wants to find in the Women's Art Library, but has to project into it. This in turn, uh, this performance was uh, a, a projection. <clears throat> uh, so what we see here in uh, this uh, photograph by Rebecca Fiebrink in um, the showroom is uh, a projection of the Women's Art Library collection itself into a gallery performance situation. Uh, this was uh, hosted by the showroom in North London as part of the cybernetic resistance project produced by Kiona with the curator Brenda Ganey. Uh, and this brings me to the powerful affect of the third relationship discussed in Caswell and Cypher's article, outlining the web of responsibilities that characterize a feminist ethic 
and that is the one that is between the archivist and the user. The authors recognize the importance of what they call radical empathy with users to acknowledge the deep emotional impact that making discoveries in the archive can have on users as they come across it. Kiona's performance of the archive not only expressed a reimagining in terms of her own autobiography, but also this moment was a nerve-wracking power shift in who was in control of the archive and how I am represented by it. Her performance is being live streamed. I'm watching it in the showroom in a, in a setting with an audience who don't know what it is. The whole thing felt exposed as I watched the artist hold up an item to the webcam and then wait to see what she writes about these uncatalogued so-called unassigned objects that I actually know very well. I feel pangs of responsibility for generating a sense of neglect when I see we, how ridiculously amateur it looks to be sticking a post-it note on what I know is a drawing by Alexis Hunter. But I think Alexis would have approved. The archive has, has set both Kiona and Alexis in a temporal loop of past into present that working relative, creatively with art documentation inevitably invites us to join. And I have a few images of a group called Name who are in the stack d doing sort of multiple projections of slides and um, their own filming. So I've worked with artists who either respond to calls for projects or propose to work with wall material and become informal artists in residence. And the process of welcoming experimental play in the space often takes the archive into other spaces virtually just as effectively as more academic projects like websites and digital apps that work to become alternative digital versions of artists' files. This is a phone-based intervention set up on a light box during the event Viva Las Projectionistas, which was part of Arliss's 50-year celebration at the Center for Contemporary Art at Goldsmiths. It was a celebration of the slide. It is a, this is a matching game using QR code links to clues read on your phone with slides from the Women's Art Library's teaching slide pack that was uh, produced in 1994 when they used to use slides in teaching. It was developed by BA curating students Mia Cordova and Agata Hosnova, especially for this event. And the project, How to Make an Archive Travel, which was realized by the sociologist Dr. Anna Maria Herman, whose research focused on the use of augmented reality by museums, is a more formal kind of uh, digitization uh, play game in my mind. Uh, her work is uh, broadly um, focused on the sociology of culture and communication. So she cre uh, Anna Maria created a digital archive that identified a sample of artists through their slide files and built on this to work with the artists to represent their practice in the space of an Apple app and could be, that could be used on an iPhone or an iPad. Uh, in addition to the art library. She created a snapshot of their practice, including an abstract of 10 words that became a means of tagging and searching, uh, a short statement, and an, and an extract of an audio recorded interview conducted by Anna Maria with each artist. These are Claire Collison's pages as she appears on an iPad. The audio records Claire talking about why she chose these images to represent her practice. Mostly projects are self-guided and they lead to exhibitions at different locations on campus. Claire Collison um, became an artist in residence at, at one point. So these uh, residencies can take years to conclude, but in a sense, this art library formed around a slide collection donated by artists, is mostly made up of artists in residence. 
Claire Collison was drawn back to the Women's Art Library by her own slides and a need to revisit her own art practice to take into account the life changes she'd experienced through breast cancer and in some ways followed the same path of creating work in response to this as her friend Joe Spence did in the 1980s and 90s. And with this extremely affective display that was set up in the Richard Hogart building, which is the main building at Goldsmiths, um, we see the art library turned into a kind of exploded diagram of practice, reflection, and tributes to peers that encapsulates the web of responsibilities that hold the Women's Art Library as a particularly enriched creative space. Claire's celebratory exhibition demonstrates how a women's art archive becomes a feminist statement of cross-references, admiration, and aesthetic pleasure. The library, not just as a collection, but as a materialized network, networking project. The slides and all the attendant information in artist productions, including multiples, zines, ephemera, photos, and other recorded encounters with artworks, emerge from an awareness of the issue of visibility in relation to art production. How do we validate art practices, support them, reference them, and acknowledge art practices emerging from different spaces other than art school? The fourth affective responsibility that Caswell and Cyphor cite is the relationship between the archivist and the larger community. I like the way they call this having responsibilities towards unseen others. How neatly this ties in with the work I am sharing here and how much of the critical work of the art library may not happen within the space of the collection itself. Just the idea of an art library that welcomes documentation from unknown artists suggests that important community building needs to continue. What makes it more critical in many artists' eyes is that it emphasizes the material rather than the digital. The Women's Art Library today is manifesting its origin as a library that found its actual niche in a community center in the early 1980s and had the ambition to grow and grow and grow. It was a space created by feminist art historians as well as artists, but its lifeblood, the slide, was the entry point for women who had self-identified as artists and all the writers, teachers, and art historians who wanted to see and share what women's art practice looked like in their own practices of teaching and publishing. The raw material of the slide library represented a deliriously uncurated swathes of possible ideas of what being an artist meant. However, the tensions between amateur and professional were subsumed by the need to recognize the critical importance of identity as well as parity that was at stake. The Women Artists Slide Library had few paid staff at this time, but Rita Keegan joining that workforce was critical to establishing a collection dedicated to black women artists called the Women of Color Index. <clears throat> and this book has been a definitive creative project realized in the, in, uh, the Women's Art Library since it went to Goldsmith and has reinterpreted the notion of the finding aid in terms of the archive, the archivist, and their community. It emerged from the residency of the artist research group X Marks the Spot that includes Ego Ahiwe Sawinski, Gina Nembard, Lauren Craig, Mystique Holloway, and Zai Holloway. This publication bears witness to how they activated the Women of Color Index, responding with artist pages and Twitter texts, a transcribed interview with Rita, and commissioned writing from scholars and artists. In addition to producing the book, they hosted a play produced by Sixth Formers at Goldsmiths and produced a slideshow of digitally restored slides of the artists represented in the Women of Color Index. The result of this creative and generative response is a testament to the process of reaching through the collection to the living practitioners and the spirit of its making. So now I want to 
I, life. So now I'm kind of leaving you here, standing in New Cross, in the crisp night air of an October evening, gazing at a digitized slide of the work of a black woman artist, lighting up the former site of the Center for Caribbean Studies in Laurie Grove, New Cross. It's a powerful image that reminds me that no research center is secure. I still collect slides because they document works found nowhere else, and this redundant technology tells the story of art practice in a unique way. That inflects our understanding of heritage and knowledge sharing and creative practices. The move away from slide collections to digital image systems has erased the tactile, hand-to-hand -hand transfer of this knowledge, this sense of gifting that the slides embodied and conveyed. While images of artwork proliferate online and context for viewing are fluid and meaning and sharing is generated by citation and is mostly screen-based, the Women's Art Library collection maintains the messiness and the immersive qualities of a physical educational feminist space, beautifully textured, as this quote, in the sense of uh, this quote from Lorraine Code. I'm going to read it because I can't resist it. And I, it's been a long time since I've read it out. Textured location where it matters is where it matters who is speaking and where and why, and where such mattering bears directly upon the possibility of knowledge claims. Artists no longer send slides, but they send their publications in order to become present in that space. And I've got this image of the boxes of artist books. Um, this is the artist book collection that uh, the Women's Art Library um, has. Uh, and uh, it's, we've been building this collection uh, of artist books since uh, Marcus Campbell invited us to have a table at the Artist Book Fair back in 1996. Um, we went further than a table and set up a whole exhibition of women artists' books curated by Kathy Courtney, which led to purchase and donations that uh, started this collection off. Um, and today the collection is the subject of a creative cataloging project that Jessa Mockridge is going to um, talk about because she uh, is directly involved with working uh, with um, the digital archive of artist publications. Um, but just, shall we do the tactile before we get into the digital? Sure. <laughs> so um, I've brought along a work uh, by a publication by the artist Bella Milroy. And it is uh, it came about from her residency in the Women's Art Library. Now, I guess I'll have to demonstrate it. I'll grab one. So now I feel like I'm back in the in the in the women's art library, I, uh, and it's good to be back. So, I have this publication by Bella Milroy. It's called File Under Female. It is a uh, a poster and has an image that um, she created using a uh, a black and white uh, disposable uh, camera. Um, Bella was the recipient of an uh, uh, an award um, to be a resident of the Women's Art Library through the Birthrights Collection. And um, she had to defer her residency because uh, she uh, developed a kind of chronic uh, fatigue syndrome. And so we, so when she finally came to the collection and walked into that, the, 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 the citadel of, of materials, she had to focus on just the a couple of boxes, and uh, she started work with the box um, that of materials that Simrath pa Patty had donated, um, that uh, that she had donated a couple of years before. So Bella is looking through this box, and she's looking for Simrath, and she comes across a double-page uh, spread in a um, in a catalog 
for the exhibition, Keeping It Together. And in this catalog, this, the, on Simrath's um, image, Simrath has inscribed rather angrily that the image of her is not a self-portrait, it's a press uh, photography. Um, it is, I didn't take this photo. Um, this is uh, selling ethnicity, file under female, and all the other isms. It's a kind of n n you know, angry intervention into the catalog, you know, the presentation of her work. And it's co a correction. So this is what uh, Bella became in, uh, inspired by. And the act of inscription, uh, she, she, uh, took, she shared with, uh, by inviting the, uh, the group, the White Pube, to um, respond to the idea of being in an archive and being in a collection, and uh, also encountering uh, Simrath's uh, box as well. And so that is on the reverse side of this image that Bella took that was taken um, of the catalog uh, double page spread under a sheet of that, that acetate that we're all sort of um, packaging everything up in. So there is this kind of um, uh, elusiveness as well to the image. And again, sort of pointing to the, the layering of um, that you experience in uh, these collections as we protect them as well as share them.